In battles with white colonists, the North American Indians showed themselves to be staunch and brave warriors. History knows many cases when North American Indians staged large-scale beatings of regular white forces. And yet, in the overall standings, the North American Indians lost. And the reason is simple, they fought momentarily, here and now. That is, the military thinking of even their best leaders was limited to tactics, and the strategy remained misunderstood and unclaimed. And a good example of this is the defeat of the Thousandth Detachment of General Arthur S.T. Clare. Historians single out a lot of battles between North American Indians and whites. But, in fact, it was one single, ongoing campaign that began immediately after the first Europeans landed on the mainland and ended somewhere only by the beginning of the 20th century, and many conflicts, considered as independent ones, can be safely represented as separate battles with complex preliminary maneuvers within the framework of one conflict. And here, in terms of duration, events easily overtake the Hundred Years' War, which, as you know, also did not suffer from a linear development of the action. Well, the peak of hostility came at the end of the 18th century. Moreover, even the American Revolution did not stop the conflict with the Indians, although at first the events on the Anglo-American fronts developed not at all fun for the colonists. By 1785, the colonists had pushed the Indian tribes to the west and those accustomed to internecine in hostility suddenly discovered the ability to consolidate, which is not surprising, just the eastern tribes were forced to occupy the former territories of the western tribes, and all those who were moved had to choose their enemy. Whites, of course, did not doze off either. They had no intention of sharing the conquered lands with the Indians, as well as stopping expansion, but there were clearly not enough forces for a large-scale conflict, and they acted extremely simply and effectively moving deep into the North American Indian territories slowly, but inevitably. The technical side of the issue looked something like this. A fort was set up on the territory of the North American Indians, part of the garrison of which began regular raids on native settlements. Moreover, those were deliberately chosen where at the current moment there were not many soldiers. In this way, the U.S. Army minimized its own losses and steadily undermined the economy of the North American Indians. And sooner or later the North American Indians were forced to make room again. And yet, such tactics of the whites left their mark on the Indian art of warfare. Many leaders began to understand that it was not enough to be brave directly in battle. It is also required to understand the enemy, to be ahead of his actions at least a step, for which it was necessary to organize regular monitoring of enemy strongholds, in order to block or mitigate his raider attacks. The change in thinking on the Indian side did not go unnoticed, although the white soldiers did not immediately understand the essence of the changes. But the consequences were felt especially after the combined forces of the Indians staged a demonstrative beating of General Josiah Harmar in 1790. True, the general himself was largely to blame for the defeat. President Washington decided that it was worth teaching the provincials the lessons of modern warfare and sent to the West General S.T. Clare, who came from a family of merchants and once trained as a doctor, but during the recent struggle with the British showed himself as a brave and efficient military leader. The new commander had about 2,000 soldiers at his disposal. Not God knows what by the standards of Europeans, but in those parts there is a considerable force. In fact, Mr. General commanded almost half of the entire then American army, but the triumph somehow did not work out from the very beginning, since there were only 600 regular soldiers, badly trained, another 600 militias and 800 temporary conscripts, the latter did not differ at all in reliability. The president demanded the immediate start of large-scale hostilities and a deep invasion of Indian territories already in the summer, and the general experienced difficulties with supplies and equipment. Why did he move slowly and reluctantly, sometimes getting stuck in large forts for a long time? In addition, the government decided to cut spending on the military apparatus and significantly reduced the funding of the army, which is why the content of contract soldiers was noticeably reduced, and many veterans chose to retire and not resume their army careers. Well. Those that came to replace those who quit were clearly not up to the required level. So St. Clare operated a force where a soldier who had served half a year was generally considered an experienced old-timer. But an order is an order. And St. Clare, albeit reluctantly, moved into hostile territory. Perhaps he himself was a brave soldier, but at the time he could not be called a full-fledged warrior. He seriously suffered from gout, which is why sometimes he not only lost the ability to clearly command and turned into a burden, very often he could not move independently, and he was taken like a sack in a saddle. The beginning of the campaign for the soldiers was going well. The soldiers built a fort, settled it, and even organized a couple of raids from it on weak villages located nearby. The Indians made room, and the general led his forces further to develop success.
but because of the mass desertion, the forces of St. Clair were significantly reduced and only a thousand people with a little went on that campaign. The Indians, all this time, carefully watched the enemy. They did not have a single command, since the whites were opposed by several tribes with their leaders, Shoshone, Miami, Delawares, Ojibwe, Seneca, Mohawks, and others. It is curious that one of the chiefs of Miami was an ethnic white. In a former life his name was William Wells, once adopted by an Indian family for education. The Indians secretly followed the military, following their actions through scouts. St. Clair's forces, meanwhile, began to build a new fort, and then, before it was completed, they went out in bulk to pinch the Indian settlements. True, they only reached the Wabash River, it is 30 miles to a new unfinished fortification. Actually, the opposing sides at that time had numerical parity, about a thousand fighters each. It must be said that the whites chose a site for a temporary camp very unsuccessfully, they simply did not fit everything on it. So part of the soldiers had to cross to the other side and build a second give back there. True, the whites did not strengthen both camps, excessive self-confidence affected. Well, the Indians were divided into small detachments of about three dozen warriors, this was the normal number of combat units familiar to their people. In addition, the Indians were not accustomed to clear interaction during the war. The leaders outlined the general picture of the battle in advance, and only then each acted independently, and in such conditions, small detachments were preferable. The Indians carefully scouted everything at dusk, but they decided to strike in the morning, during breakfast. It was just that, according to army regulations, at that moment the soldiers put muskets in the goats and were distracted by the food being distributed, so this was the most favorable moment for a strike. The artillery of the colonists was located on a cliff in a larger camp. Moreover, it was divided into two groups, facing in opposite directions. It turned out that the guns stood in the center of two lines, and to counter the artillery, the Indians allocated a separate detachment under the leadership of the same white who accepted the Indian dogmas. The first blow fell on the militias who crossed to the other side. They did not offer any resistance and simply panicked, dropping their weapons and rushing across the river again to rejoin the main forces. At this time, the Indian warriors carefully shot the crews trying to pull their guns into combat positions, and they never fired a single shot during the battle. The soldiers under the command of St. Clair still managed to organize resistance. They lined up in a square and fired a volley at the advancing Indians. Then bayonets joined and tried to break through. The Indians, of course, did not accept a bayonet attack and retreated into the forest, arranging an indicative flank coverage by counterattacks. Moreover, this action was repeated several times. William Dark's battalion, for example, tried three times to go to the bayonet, after which it was destroyed outright by flank attacks. Although those who remained in position had a hard time, the Indians by that time were conveniently located on the flanks and arranged a longitudinal shelling of the camp. In a word, the colonists had no chance. General St. Clair first tried to organize his soldiers, three horses were killed under him, and he fought almost paralyzed. He had to be loaded into the saddle every time, because he himself could not do this due to an attack of illness. But as a result, nevertheless, St. Clair went on a decisive massive breakthrough towards that very unfinished fort. Moreover, they decided to leave all the supplies and the wounded in the camp. The breakthrough was successful, and the remnants of St. Clair's army reached the fort. Moreover, the general himself rode across the saddle as a passenger, since he could no longer sit on his own. But then it turned out that the fort was not able to take so many wounded wounded already during the last blow. There was not enough medicine or space, and the wounded had to be moved to the first fort, and that's another 70 miles. Actually, the remnants of the forces of the colonists were saved only by the fact that the Indians were distracted by the robbery of the camp. By the way, they also became interested in the wounded. The fires then burned for several days in a row. In total, 300 returned from the expedition of St. Clair from the previous thousand, and this is not counting 200 civilians. Immigrants went with the detachment, of which none survived. Well, 24 people were unharmed, including six officers. The rest of the survivors were injured. The Indians lost 21 killed and 40 wounded. In other words, St. Clair's troop lost 88% of its officers and over 97% of its enlisted men. To make the scale of the disaster clearer, we can say that the late defeat of Custer is much more sparing, the losses of St. Clair are three times greater in absolute terms. Well, for the army, it generally seemed like a disaster. The armed forces of America of that time decided at once a quarter of the army personnel. By the way, the government was so shocked by the results of the raid that for the first time it authorized a detailed investigation into the disaster, which, however,
came to the conclusion that the general was innocent. They blamed the suppliers. Although he no longer had to fight, the title was left to him, but he was removed from any command. As for the Indians, they rejoiced at the trophies, and then dispersed to their native wigwams, because they decided that they had decisively defeated the white colonists and the conflict was not expected in the near future. Meanwhile, the colonists voted for a sharp increase in the size of the army and an increase in its funding. The U.S. Army did not tolerate such defeats either before or after. However, the real results of this glorious victory were not so significant. Without even thinking about the need to consolidate local success, the Indian warriors went home to feed their families. They perceived the military campaign only as an episode of their lives. Unlike whites, they simply did not know what strategic planning was. In addition, their wars were never fought to completely knock out a competitor, therefore, by winning individual battles, the Indians lost the war as a whole. It never occurred to them to infect blankets with smallpox or completely kill the buffalo population. General St. Clare was retired and replaced by General Wayne. The U.S. Army was replenished and reorganized. Against the advice of the Little Turtle, the Indian tribes did not negotiate. In 1794 they were defeated at the Battle of Fallen Timbers, and a year later they were forced to recognize U.S. sovereignty over the Northwest. At the beginning of the 20th century, the remnants of the brave children of the prairie were squeezed into tiny reservations and lost all political power. Well, they sent General Anthony Wayne, nicknamed Mad for his courage, to the West. But that's another story.